I can reveal that the uh, 2013 Edinburgh Festival Fringe will feature 45,464 performances of 2,871 shows in 273 venues right across the city and beyond. There's lots of fantastic things going on, it's crazy. You could go to some show at 2 o'clock in the morning with a you know, with a naked man balance and a tray on the end of his knob or something, you'll probably find a couple of 75-year-old ladies from Morningside in the front row, you know. Well, just, there's a great range of uh, stuff on, you know, not just comedy, but also, you know, bad a cappella <laughs> and uh, groups of drama students lying down motionless in the Royal Mile. <laughs> this is what I was meant to do. We've seen beauty here. There's been magic on stage here. Have you come back by popular demand? I'd love to think so. Since I discovered Free Fringe, I am a massive fan. A festival is a celebration of the art that we make. It's really happy to see people that I would never, ever think that they would come to see the show coming out with really smiley faces and having had a really great time. And it's just extraordinary that the, the, the creativity that I've been exposed to, the ideas and the, the different places, the different connections between neurons that have never been connected before. This is where I want to spend every summer. I could do this, I want to do this, and so here I am. I, I think it's just about magic, I mean, and it's all about your heart thing, you know, go in with it with, with a great feeling. And it is incredible because the amount of creativity that can come out of it is amazing. My name is Kevin Short, it's an appropriate name. Do you go to the Free Fringe? Yes, we do. That's me, Kevin Short. I've been coming to the Fringe since the 70s, but this year I decided to join the Free Fringe, which is challenging the established commercial fringe in a similar way to how it all began. That was back in 1947, when just eight companies came up to provide an alternative to the International Festival. It's grown a lot since then. But even though it's the largest arts festival in the world, some people still don't know how it started, why people come, and what exactly it is. So I thought I'd try and find out. And who better to start with than the veteran, Phil Jupiter? You know what? You're not paying, so you could fucking clap. My own friends that have not been to the Fringe before see that rhythm of me every August disappearing. And what, what's he doing? Where are you going? What are you going? Oh, he's doing that Edinburgh thing again. They eventually, well, what is it? The Fringe started out as a kind of um, ad hoc thing by a group of enthusiasts, and it's kind of turned into the biggest bit of the festival, really. No, The Fringe in some ways is, is a very different beast than it was um, when I was first involved in it and, and yes, presumably from when it was first founded. But in, but in other ways it's remarkably similar and I think the main uh, success of The Fringe and the, and the main defining feature about it is that anyone who wants to take part in it can. It's a completely open access festival. Oh. Anybody in the world could go, go represent themselves and be in the Edinburgh Fringe and be in the programme. That open access principle is as true today as it was in the very beginning. What's happened is it's made it even made it even more accessible for more people to come into. Yes, open access and accessible if you can afford it. Over recent years, there's been strong criticism of what some call the commercial fringe, and one of the answers to that has been the emergence of the free fringe. Why should some people make money and others lose money? And should the first incentive be business? It is a big investment on anybody's part to get here. You know, that, that idea that somehow what we're doing is wrong and what they're doing is right. Yes, there are people who make money, there's no doubt about it. How many people are in the press room? How many people are in the selling ticket? I mean, they're, they're, it's pretty, and they're all receiving good wages, I imagine. It's this word commercial, and the sense that somehow commercial equals bad. It's generally bad. Does commercial equal greedy? I can't think of anyone makes money. I mean, it's probably the sort of, you know, the manager, you know, PR companies, and it's not the performer, which is, I think, a shame. I'm not a shareholder. I'm simply an employee. It's, you know, and, and I earn a, a, a reasonable wage out of it, as, as I would expect and would hope that anybody who works in this company gets something out of it. What I like is, is that someone sort of had the wherewithal to go, come on, remember what this, it used to be like. Well, we might not be the first to come.
come here on the train To tell our jokes and sing our songs and fly her in the rain I mean, the cost of the fringe is ridiculous, really. You know, you had to pay for it somewhere. Why does A get it and B doesn't? You know, that's the, that's the dilemma. And it's the free, free fringe. A dilemma indeed. But perhaps one of the major guiding lights of the free fringe, Peter Buckley Hill, has the answer. Why exactly did the free fringe start? The simple fact that nobody could come here to the Fringe on the terms that were then prevailing and have a show that was A, successful, B, enjoyable and C, did not cost them a very great deal of money. My favourite development has certainly been the Free Fringe and what the Free Fringe has done. Well, I mean, I was doing a paid show and then I was invited to do a guest spot at somebody's Free Fringe show and I, as soon as I went in I thought this really is, you know, what it's about. Oh, I knew that's me. When I started doing The Fringe, and I was about 1982, um, there was a lot of spirit, a lot of spirit, spirit there, a lot of things you could just, people would just go and get a show together and bring it up. And The Free Fringe just captured that spirit in the way that the, uh, the, the Gilded Balloon, the Presence and the Assembly Rooms had sort of like turned it into a cartel. Why do you choose to do the free fringe as opposed to the unfree fringe? Because we're broke. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have exquisite talent that because they have no money, and it's not things like Britain's Got Talent and America's Got Talent, because I've been on both of them, and that isn't where the talent is. But these wonderful, wonderful little flowers that could bloom if we could only give them a chance. And when the fringe started, that's what happened. It, it is one of those things that you find so often that, that something idealistic begins and then it becomes commercialised and, and, and that can be a bit of a downfall for it. I read all the stuff about how you have to, you know, and at the box office this and, and this comes out of it and so forth and I just I didn't want to get involved in that and I'm very glad I didn't. Apparently, if your show gets picked up by another promoter or another theatre at the Fringe here, Assembly will take a percentage of your show wherever it goes. And that's very scary. I mean, that means you become just, you know, a pawn for Assembly. And they're mm. so big, you know. Yeah, you know they, yeah. they just get bigger and when, bigger. When you've paid them so much money in order yeah. to be in their venue mm. in the first place. Yeah. A lot of more established comedians are doing, are moving back to the free fringe just because the prices of, of like the assembly rooms and Gilded Bloom and all that is just so ridiculously expensive. You could be selling out every night and still not make any money. It costs a lot of money to go to the fringe. I mean, are you going to break even? No. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people talk about coming up and going, oh, you lose, you lose 10 grand if you come to Edinburgh. I'm like, well, if I took all my family to Disneyland, that cost me 15 grand, and I don't go, oh, I went to Disneyland, I lost 15 grand. I'm at the biggest arts festival in the world, seeing and performing in some amazing shows. What an adventure. I mean, this is the adventure of a lifetime. Really, it's a dream of a lifetime. I don't have big houses, whatever big means. I don't have big reviews, but what I have are hearts. I am touching hearts, I am touching people. My advice? We shouldn't worry so much what the other people are thinking. Just go with your flow. It's, it's going to become increasingly the case that people will be going, well, there's lots and lots of quality out there if you're prepared to look for it. On Free Fringe, why pay 10, 12 pounds to go and see a show that may or may not be good when you can go to a Free Fringe show and then if you like it, you can pay, and if you don't, then it is your choice to, mm. to vote with your feet. The Free Fringe's um, aim is that most shows should approximately pay these. Um, the word approximately, I suppose, is plus or minus 500 or 1,000 pounds. They certainly should not lose a four-figure sum compared to the four-figure sum that it is said um, they will lose at the money venue. This year is the first time I've encountered the Free Fringe 
and I am really impressed with it. I, I think that the quality of performance that I've seen on the Free Fringe has been really spectacular. I don't want to go as a tourist. I really want to go with a job. Wait a minute. Isn't there something called the Fringe and you can go to that with your show? If it weren't for the Free Fringe, I wouldn't be doing Edinburgh anymore. Not enough people think about the positives of being here, just for their own mental well-being. Forget what it'll do for your career, for your soul. What Edinburgh does for your soul, I think, is key. I believe the Free Fringe is the nearest thing to what the Fringe is about. For more freedom, really. Uh, there's less pressure, I suppose, but um, it really kind of fits the, the vibe of the Fringe, where you can kind of experiment and, and do what you want to do, and people still kind of enjoy themselves watching it. You know, embrace it. Embrace it. Don't be frightened of it. It's a wonderful... It's an, it's, it's an amazing thing. But has everyone embraced the free fringe? Maybe not. Could there really be an emerging rivalry between the free fringe and the established paid for fringe? It's become quite a battle these days. I don't think it was ever a battle. They live side by side like the badger and the fox. I don't know who, where this rivalry is coming from. And which is which, I will not say. Um, but uh, one of them does give you TB if you get bitten by them. To think that, that it's just about deal making and poaching and fighting over what's going on is just, it's just wrong. I'm not fighting with anybody. It's so hard, you know, because we're, we're, in a, we're in a capitalist world. Is it free? I mean, I find when I go to the free fringe, it costs me more than when I ever go anywhere else. If you think about the average fringe goer's day, you're going to see so many shows. And if there isn't a few free ones there as well, it's just going to break the bank. <laughs> yeah. I think the arts are very good at being um, collaborative and competitive at the same time. Like, the other belly doesn't want PBH there, like, because at the end of the day, they are all competing. And of course, the fringe is a very competitive environment for companies and venues. But. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for a competition, no one would get any better. I don't think there was ever a prize. I mean, well, sorry, what is the prize? Prize surely is. But surely this is a way of life, isn't it? Isn't this what this is about? You kind of can't blame them for making money when they can. Mm. It's about supply and demand. And at the end of the day, if there are people that are prepared to pay it, then they can charge it. You know, there's room for all of us. Of course, there are things I, they do that I wouldn't do that way. There are things now that are done everywhere that I wouldn't do that way. But it doesn't mean they're not the right things to do. My objection to the Free Fringe, and I hope you can edit this, is that most of the shows are crap. I'm sorry, but they are. It's like having delinquent children, the Free Fringe. They, they don't listen to their shows because they don't have to pay to put this thing on. So it's some big lark. And they don't listen. And they don't listen that when the audience doesn't laugh, they're not funny. But these delinquent children are like earthy, fabulous creators. The problem is that it's just like summer camp, when you're a counselor at a summer camp. The people who have been there the longest get a lot of priorities they shouldn't get. If it really were an equal playing field, I would love it, but it isn't. I think, if anything, it encouraged people to come to Edinburgh um, because they know they can see three shows. And They'll, they might they see someone else, they might get fired for a show here and go, do you know what, I might go and see that. I don't see why they shouldn't pay for what they see. And I'm sorry if, if you know, if anybody puts money in a bucket and then tells me that, you know, actually I pay my taxes, I pay my VAT, I pay all of that. You know, the Free Fringe, do they pay any VAT? Do they put anything into the public purse? I'm not entirely sure who's, which bit of this is free. Who's making a nonsense out of who? The difference between us and the money fringe is a difference of body language. When the audience pays £15 for a ticket, their body language is this. I've paid. Entertain me, you bastards. But the free fringe, the body language is this. I'm taking a chance on this. If it is really not on my wavelength, I will probably sneak out after 10 or 15 minutes and go somewhere which is on my wavelength. And I must admit, we all sneak out from time to time. But even then, you can see talent galore on the streets without paying a cent. So we have packed streets, packed venues, literally millions of tourists, but can the city and the festival take it? Might the tiger have to be tamed? Can it get too big for its own good? It's a bit its own creature. Well, this is the annual question 
which I've been asked 50 years, for the past 50 years, every year. Well, it's been getting too big ever since it started, hasn't it? I have heard the phrase collapsing on itself several yeah. times. Do you feel that it could get too big, the fringe, that it could it implode at some point? It seems awfully big now. Every year I've been here, people have said, oh, it's getting too big, you know, and it's continued getting bigger, and it's still here. There's no getting away from the fact that the Edinburgh Fringe and the Edinburgh International Festival are two of the biggest arts festivals in the world, and that is always going to be a powerful magnet to the creative. As the festival grows, the free fringe is growing, probably actually to a greater degree. So I, th I think, you know, that, that might possibly end up taking over a little more each year. No one can control it. Uh, it has, you know, it sort of does, it goes in ways that you don't really know. I and mean, I think after the, well, you know, when the recession came in and last year when the Olympics was on, I think generally everyone thought, oh, it's going to be like right down. But it wasn't much and it seems to be back up again this year, you know. I don't think it'll ever implode. I think I don't think it's a case that there's a sort of, you know, that, that, that it's all going to come crashing down. I think it's perfect. I don't know because it, get, it keeps getting bigger and it keeps getting more exciting. Put the prices up a bit more, be a few more um, paid shows, yeah, and then uh, people like me get more audiences. <laughs> I don't think there's such a thing as too much. What the hell, why not? I don't think anyone should be told not to come. Like, if it gets too big, I think the festival should just accommodate to the size of and that how popular it's got. You know, it's not, it's not for us to see how big it should be. We're, it's our job to support people who want to take part in it. Things like this don't implode. Rather than um, it outgrowing itself, it may actually become more accessible. Its, it's largeness allows companies like us to be able to make it in. You understand? Uh, there might be the danger of clannishness. Uh, if, you know, it's, it's always, you know, uh, it's for uh, art for art's sake. They die as trees die from the heart out, from the heart outwards. Uh, they carry on uh, as slightly diminished versions of their former selves until eventually they fall into disrepair. Um, they will undoubtedly in a hundred years time be something called the Edinburgh Fringe, but whether it will still be huge or tiny is what we cannot predict. So, what can we predict for the future? What is the way forward for the festival and what should be the everlasting ethos? The Free Fringe has a very definite ethos Which and is? it is a cooperative ethos. Everybody works with each other and supports each other's shows. It cannot work otherwise. The ethos is you sort it out for yourselves. If things go wrong, you work it out and you work as a team within your venue and try and put things right and everybody helps each other. And, and to me, that's what it's about. I, I feel like Edinburgh is a bit like Field of Dreams. It's if you build it, they will come. It seems to me a little bit like the Free Fringe does not have the respect that the other Fringe has. So I would like to change that mm. for a start. It would be nice if um, the respect comes, if people realise that free doesn't mean cheap. What I love to do most of all in a way in Edinburgh is just drift around the beautiful city, uh, smoking and thinking and gazing at all the wonder of the world that is here. And Edinburgh has made me whatever I am. I think halfway through the third week there should be a free day. Every show at the Fringe is free. Gauntlet thrown down, people. Free day. I'd like to make it easier for young companies to come up and not lose money. You do not come to the fringe to get found. Don't accept what you're being told about Edinburgh. You do not come to the fringe to be discovered. The only way that you'll break the mould is by breaking it yourself. And so I just think it's in the hands of the artists, the future. Of the, it's not all about the, the big venues. I think the bigger the free fringe gets, the harder it will be for those big venues to charge those crazy, crazy rents that they do charge. We like the idea that people can kind of like pay come and pay feel, what yeah. they feel. And that sits well with us. Kind of and out in thrust, doesn't it? Yeah. The free fringe is only expanding, you know, and the, and the, the big venues can bury their heads in the sand as long as they want, but the free fringe ain't going away. And people want to do free shows won't go away. You do not come to the fringe to make money. You do not come to the fringe to get an agent. You come to the fringe to make contacts, to make friends, and to develop. It is the best festival in the world. Uh, to remain that, it has to keep regenerating itself. 
to regenerate itself, it's got to make sure that the work it does is the best in the world. There's something for me about Edinburgh which just fires me off in so many different ways. It's inspiring, it's gruelling, it's, it's, it's funny, it's tragic, it's sad, it's just all of these emotions compressed, you know. Young, new, energetic, uh, never take no for an answer. I think it's a celebration of creativity. You can try out ideas here that, because the audience here are very, you know, they're up for it. Anything goes, there's no limits. People can express themselves however they want, in whatever way. Experimentation? Yeah, keep it organic, really. It's a wonderful gift, and I'm, I'm so grateful that I can be a part of it. I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Experimenting um, in terms of the audience, you know, like you were saying, that kind of people have come that we weren't expecting, that trying out new things that you might not go and see, which you can do when it's free. Um, and that's, in a way, the greatest thing of all of the Edinburgh Fringe is the audience. I think it should be the diversity of culture, and yet the fact that it makes us all one, it makes us global, it makes us, it's what unites us. The diversity actually brings everyone together. It's built in the word festival, festive. I think it should be a fun occasion. You know, people talk about the spirit of the French. What is the spirit of the French? It, it, it's a community. It's a great big community that, it's a family that comes back together once a year. Seeing old friends, meeting new friends, and the, the times I'm not in the theater. I mean, when I'm having a beer or a glass of wine or having a meal, or that's for me the most important part of Edinburgh. The Edinburgh Fringe is like screaming into a deep, dark pit of despair, and no one can hear you. And you can think of it as quite a horrendous thing for that reason, or you can enjoy it because no one can hear you and you can make it exactly what you want it to be. Because outside these three weeks, no one's gonna know what you did. No one's gonna care what you did. No one is ever gonna read your reviews unless you tell them to. So you can do whatever you like and it's amazing. The true ethos of this festival, uh, in the beginning, all through its history, at the moment and in the future, is that, it's, is that anyone who wants to take part in it can and no one will tell them what they can and can't do or what they shouldn't, shouldn't try. Well, it's the end of another festival for me. Did my show on the Free Fringe make money? Of course not. Did I expect it to? Of course not. Will I come again? Of course I will. But next time, I'll do an almost Free Fringe. Taking the model of another company, it'll be free on the day if you can get in, and only five pounds to pre-book to secure a seat. Maybe that's the way forward. Meanwhile, I'm going to have one of the best all-day breakfasts on the Fringe. See you next year. Yeah, you'd better come prepared. This is MC Squared to tell you about the proportions like that's gonna make you scared. It's been the crazy head rapper who has dared to declare that the E is the M to the C to the square. This is energy mass equivalence. There's no ambivalence. This is inevitable influence once you cancel out the dividends. I'll set the world aflame with my outrageous claim. Energy and mass are one and the same. I'm gonna give reality a brand new face. Gonna communicate my case. Gonna prove it to be true. I'm gonna lay before you a theory of space. <laughs> And it's about time too. <laughs> My name is Kimmy Short, it's an appropriate name. Ever since I was a kid, I've always been short changed. And it's the most exciting thing I've ever done in uh, my life. Uh, better than sex. Uh, really? Honest to God, I right. promise and, you. And you're still doing that, presumably? No, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> take your condoms and have a great I'll take my condoms and take my chances. <laughs> exactly. Maybe about three in the morning, if anybody wants to offer, or they can call me up, I'll make an appointment. But right now, <laughs> right now I'm still wandering around looking for the G-spot. Just you go ahead. He lived in Portugal for a while earlier, and he's just, he's just he's checking out uh, England. He doesn't like it. It's a bit unprofessional, I just need to quickly consult my uh, my notes. This is Scott. That's a G. Yeah. It's the same thing. There's no such thing as uh, Scotland, he says. It's a... Uh, uh, <laughs> get off, get off. Scotland and England is the same place. It's just, it's just different mouth noises for the same. It's the same. It's the same island. I mean, it doesn't really matter. When, uh, when you've got the UK, I suppose you, spend, uh, you do the Chinese song tuning, do you? 
<laughs> I mean, that's a good gag, you should use that. Yeah. <laughs> Scottish people are just English people with a funny accent. Yeah. And the funny dresses. Kilts. I think it's shortcut, but I never cut the shortcut short. Well, I'm plugging the um, I'm I'm plugging Rock and Roll's greatest failure, Otway the movie, um, and I think that <clears throat> that if anything's going to make me into an international star, that probably will, because um, that can tour without me. <laughs> Do you foresee yourself being here for a long time in the future? Yes. I need to find a different job. I think. <laughs> I never cut the shortcut short. Love, 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 the roads are not for me. No, no, I don't want them. If I see a rainbow, I don't chase, but I'll dig for go old just in case. I estimate that Leonard Cohen has smoked about 600,000 fags, had 50,000 bottles of red wine, and taken approximately a million pounds of Class A drugs. He is bang up there with Keith Richards and Barry Cryer. And it's also almost impossible to imagine given that he took speed as his drug of choice, quite what Leonard Cohen's songs would have sounded like if he hadn't been on speed. In my pocket, not one penny. And my friends, I haven't any. Kevin, you can sing along because I see you. Never get back on my feet again. <laughs> then I'll meet my long lost friends. It's mighty strange, without a doubt. Nobody knows you when you're down. That's a wrap. Thank you very much.